I'm actually really excited. Generally, when God has me read something, it's uh, punitive towards me. <laughs> but today, we get to read something that's a little more upbeat and joyful. So if you will, once you get those Bibles and everything in hand, if you'll turn to Philippians. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Always be full of joy in the Lord. Maybe some of y'all have the shirt. Tell your face. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds everything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I'm sure that's good news for me. I know that it's good news for you. It's even better. Maybe yours, your Bible has the same thing. There's a little asterisk in there about the Lord is coming soon. If you take that back to the original Greek, it actually translates directly to the Lord is here now. Don't wait for God to get here. Go ahead, put a smile on your face. Experience His joy. Live it out every day like it's a practice and a habit. It'll only hurt for a little while, and then you'll get used to it. Your face will get those muscles. They'll build up. It'll be all right. And while we work on practicing on that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. See if he can't help us out with that. Some of us that are just not capable of cracking that smile this morning, I understand. We're going to work on that a little bit. Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here today. You have placed us all in a country where we have the freedom right now to be able to congregate and to experience your love. We have the ability to worship in your house. Not everybody has that freedom, so thank you so much. If we got nothing else to be thankful for this morning, whether we are saved or lost, we can be thankful that you placed us here in a land where we have more freedom to exercise our rights than anywhere else in the world. Thank you so much for this place that you've provided for us to be able to come together, to be able to worship you, to be able to learn about your word. Thank you for the people that you've raised up, the men in this church that are going to speak to us today and every other day. Thank you for the men that you've raised up for study hall, and thank you for Emmanuel's message this morning. Help us as we go through your word today. Bring the Holy Spirit down on this place. May it engulf us because our understanding is not your ways. We need the Holy Spirit to help us explain and really penetrate our heart with the words that you have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Many of you know that uh, the reason we're in town this weekend is because a certain redhead got married yesterday. Um, thank you for all that you did to love on Jeremy and Jessica. Thank you for the support that you showed her and the family. Uh, and in, in case you're wondering, um, all they did last night was hold hands. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, I mean, literally, when she when when he kissed her, I was like, I still want to punch you, man. I don't know. Uh, so you just pray for me. I will say this. The the only way it'll be justified is they bring me another grandbaby. Then they're fine. They can do what they want. But uh but uh it it was a wonderful service. It was a wonderful ceremony. God was good. It was a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. I was just telling Stacy Keller that there was uh, one point that I couldn't breathe. And I was just like, okay, I'm getting ready to pass out. Ben Suggs just is going to have to come up here and finish the ceremony. So, uh, but uh, thank you. Many of you told me you were praying for me. Thank you for that. And, and I think there's a chance uh, that she might be watching. They may be watching the live stream. So do me a favor. After I count to three, say, hey, Jeremy and Jessica, ready? One, two, three. If they're not, well, that was just awkward. All right. And so lately, God has just been working, as you can probably imagine. Um, I maybe you're different, but Joshua getting married. Go, oh, do your thing, son. Do your thing. All right. I asked him to give me a grandbaby. He did. Okay. Cool. No problem. Um, but there's something about, you, you do realize for 19 years, Jessica was my baby girl. She was my youngest. And so i um, been thinking a lot lately because what's my heart's cry for her? Uh, my heart's cry for her is to be blessed. 
my heart's cry is for her and Jeremy to experience a better life than I have. And I'll be honest with you, I've had a great life. And so I've um, been ta- thinking about th- things and wrestling with things. And, and I came back to this phrase, happiness, 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 happiness. And, and if, if y'all know me, if you've been around for a while, you know I'm not a big fan of happiness, mainly not because there's anything wrong with happiness. It's because what this culture has done to it, right? And God gave me this fact, and this fact has kind of led me down a road that I want you to go with me today. And the fact is this. Jesus willingly shares with us the keys to happiness. Jesus willingly shares with us the keys to happiness. Man, I would just love for some of y'all. I know know some of you, or you're just not much Bible people. But if you just read the red letters, because if you read the red letters, I think you'll see a Jesus that you've never met before. Because it shocked me, and, and by the way, I have read the real letters a lot, but it shocked me when God's like, hey, Randy, Jesus willingly shares with you, with Jeremy and Jessica, with us, the keys to happiness. And, and he immediately took me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 11. Nine times Jesus says, God blesses you if you do blank. God blesses you if you do blank. And then he goes on to share some of the keys to to being blessed by God. You're saying, but Randy, I thought we were talking about happiness. Well, here's where maybe this will surprise you as it did me. Let me give you the biblical definition of God blesses. The definition of God blesses is this, supremely blessed, happy, and well off. And so when it says God blesses you for doing blank, he's saying you will be supremely blessed, you will be happy, and you will be well off. If you dig a little deeper, if you go back into the Hebrew, that word says how happy. I mean, it's how happy with an exclamation point. How happy you will be if you do certain things. We see the same word for God blesses in Matthew 16, 17, where Jesus replied, you are blessed. Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You know what he's talking about there. Has God ever spoken to you? Has God ever spoken to you personally? Well, you are what? You are supremely blessed when that happens. You get happy and you are well off. Now, here's the thing that that bothers me. It shouldn't have surprised me that God, Jesus willingly shares the gifts, the keys to happiness. Why? Because he says about himself in John 10, 10, my purpose is to give people a rich and satisfying life. And so this is what God said to me. He said, Randy, I am not against happiness. The Bible is not against happiness. What they are against, what God and the Bible are against is making happiness our idol, making happiness the focus of our life. It's the same thing as when we focus on the gift rather than the giver. And that's what God has a problem with. He doesn't have a problem with you and I wanting to be happy. He, he even gives us the keys to happiness. He just doesn't want the, our happiness to be our idol. He doesn't want our happiness to be our main focus. And so if we're going to be happy, though, we've already, I don't know, you got a glimpse of it there. Jesus says, God blesses those who do blank. So if we want to be happy, something needs to happen, and that something is found in this truth, and the truth is this. If we want to feel good, we must do good. If we want to feel good, we must do good. Remember what God says to Cain in Genesis 4, 7. He says, if you had done the right thing, you would be smiling. He told Cain, hey, Cain, if you had done the right thing, you would have been happy. But because you have done evil, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. Now, I don't know about you, but I I whined to the Lord a little bit about this because I said, you know what, God, what I want, God, if I had created the universe, God, what I want is for happiness to be crouching at my door. I want happiness to, to try to jump on me and attack me and overcome me, right? I want happiness to want to rule me. But what God is saying to us there in Genesis 6 is this, is that the only thing we don't have to work at is sin. You might want to write that down. The only thing we don't have to work at is sin. It comes naturally. But if we really want to be happy, I, this is what I, I'm, I'm wondering if some of you really do want to be happy. 
Because if we really want to do, be happy, we're going to have to do what God said to Cain. If you would do right thing, if you would have done the right things, you would be happy. You would be smiling. And so what right things do we need to do in order to be happy? What right things do we, want to, we have to do in order for God to bless us? Well, we see, number one, if we want to be happy, the first key to happiness is we have to free our world from worry through prayer. We have to free our world from worry through prayer. Go back to verse 6 that Tara read. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. Now, I don't know why. I don't know about you, but there's certain words I don't think I have to look up. There's certain words that I just feel like I know. You know, and prayer is one of those. Pray. He says, pray about everything. God's like, hey, why don't you stop? And so I looked up the word pray. And it, what is the definition of pray? It means to exchange wishes. Now, do me a favor. Underline that word exchange. Because what that means is, is if you're going to pray the way God wants you to pray, you are to give him your wishes. You are to give him your desires. But, whoa, 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 what's the word exchange mean? You need to listen to his. And so biblical prayer is Shannon going to God and saying, God, I really wish Wiley would do this. God, I really wish my husband would do that. God, I really wish this. God, I really wish that. God, I really wish. And then she goes, okay, God, but what do you want? What do you want from me? And so if we're going to pray in a way that frees us from worry, we have to exchange wishes. We have to give a heartfelt cry. We see an example of it in 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, give all your worries and cares to God. Why? Because he cares about you. Now, before we can get to this prayer thing, we need to establish this fact. And some of you have tried to ignore it. Some of you have tried to pretend it's not true. But the fact is this. Most of the things we worry about never happen. Most of the things that we worry about never happen. In fact, I, Paul and I were talking about it the other day. He's got somebody in his life that they worry about a thousand things. And 999 of those things don't happen. But if one thing out of a thousand happens, they go, see, worry works. I'm justified in my worry. Really, you're one for a thousand. And you're saying that, that you're not focusing on the 999 things that didn't happen. You're focusing on the, really? Blind squirrels find nuts. I mean, this ain't hard. And so most of the things we worry about never happen. Why? Because Jesus says it's a worthless act. Worry is a worthless act. He asks in Matthew 6, 27, can any of you, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And so let's do a little experiment. I feel like I'm in eighth grade science class. But let's do a little memory experience, all right? I, I know some of you, you're, you're going through the change. You're having hot flashes. You're doing all that stuff, and your, your short-term memory is not going well right now. But let's try, let's try to the best of our ability. I want you to do a memory experience, uh, experiment with me. Let's compare all the things that you have worried about. How, what was the result of that with all the things that you have prayed about? Let's compare the results. Let's put all of your, the results of your worry in this hand and, and, and compare all the results of your prayers in this hand and tell me which one fills up faster. You see, think about it. For example, think about your finances. What works better? You worrying about your finances or you praying to the God of Philippians 4.19 that says, Father God will richly, underline that word richly, will richly fill your every need in glorious way through Christ Jesus. So what works better when it comes to your money in the bank? What works better, you worrying about it or you praying about it? I'm telling you that if we want to be happy, then we must free our world from worry through prayer. Now, here's the thing, though. Notice this truth. Prayer, though, is more than words. Prayer is more than words. I have found that prayer involves two things. It involves God's will and faith. If we're going to pray biblically, it involves God's will, praying God's will, and praying with faith. You're saying, Randy, why is this so important? Well, Romans 8, 26 says this. We don't know what God wants us to pray for. Can I ask you a question? Just think about this. Use your brain. What's the percentage of likelihood that God's going to answer a prayer for you that goes against his will? 
So, but Romans 8.26 is absolutely right. I don't know about you, but most of the time that I'm worried about something or I'm tempted to worry about something, I really don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray. And so how do we know God's will? Well, Matthew 7, 7 tells us, it says, ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find. Now, some of you have always tried to use that as, as a way to say, I'm going to get more money because I'm asking God for more money. And I'm seeking for money. I'm going to find, I'm going to find me a pot. No, how about we apply it to spiritual principles here and we ask God, hey, God, what's your will in this situation? God, I'm seeking your will. I want to know your will. God, in fact, I'm going to shut up and I'm not even going to pray until you share with me what your will is in this situation. But notice it's not only knowing God's will and praying. Prayer is also faith, praying with faith. Well, where do we get the faith? Second Peter 1, 1 tells us, faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. I'm going to keep telling you, I'm going to keep telling you, I'm going to keep telling you. Faith is a gift. Some of you keep trying to faith more. You keep trying to, I want more faith more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to faith harder. Faith is a gift. And so if you're lacking faith, James 4, 2 tells us what? You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And so let's, let's, let's make this very practical. If we want to free our world from worry through prayer so that we can be happy, then here's what it sounds like. We start off with God. What do you want to do about blank, this kid of mine, blank, this job of mine, blank, this marriage of mine, blank, this pastor of mine? What do you want to do about that? And then whatever comes to mind, whatever is laid upon your heart, no matter how crazy it sounds, pray about it. Pray what God places on your heart. And then, how about this? At the end of your prayer, you end with by joining the dead in Mark 9, 24. You say, God, I do have faith, but not enough. Help me have more. You think that might make a dent in your life? You think that might change your countenance? You think that might change your heart? You think that might lead to happiness? If you freed, what would have, What would your day look like? In fact, some of you, I don't think you would know what to do yourself if God freed your world from worry. You're like, well, what do I do with all my free time? I guess I have to get a hobby. Maybe make cakes. I don't know. Do something. So, but if we want to be happy, the first right thing we have to do, right? We have to free our world from worry through prayer. But notice number two. If we're going to be happy, if we want to be happy, the second key to happiness is we must free our spirit from selfishness through generosity. We must free our spirit from selfishness through generosity. Man, notice what Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 says. It says, give freely and become more wealthy. I know that sounds crazy, but it is true. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. It's a promise. But what happens? Things get tight. Time gets tight. Our, our, our emotions get frail. frail. Our, our, our money gets tight. What do we do? We become stingy, and the very thing that we're afraid of happens to us because the Bible says God has set this universe up that if you're stingy, you're going to lose it all. But if you're generous, you will prosper. What does he mean by generous? To be generous means to be a blessing, to be big-hearted and unselfish. We see the same word in Deuteronomy eleven twenty six. 26. It says, look today, I am giving you the choice between a blessing and a curse. What Moses was talking about there, he's saying, hey, I'm giving you a choice. If you obey the commands of God, you will either experience God as a big-hearted, unselfish person, or you're going to experience God as a curse. And so here's what he, notice what he says there. He says, if you want to prosper, you must be a blessing to people, big-hearted and unselfish. By the way, when's the last time somebody called you big-hearted? When's the last time somebody said to you, man, they always give me more than I expect? When's the last time somebody said, really what they're calling you is generous? You're saying, I don't know, what's the problem with me? I, that's not me. I don't, no, nobody that I know would, would, would accuse me of being generous. Well, can I share with you the fact? And the fact is this. We don't give because we don't love. We don't give because we don't 
love. 1 John 3, 7, 7, 18 says this. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Now, real quick, because I know what some of you are doing right now, you're saying, well, I don't have money, so therefore that verse doesn't apply to me. Can I explain something to you? Can you please get your head out of your belly button? Everybody in America is living well. Our poor are well-fed. That's a nice way of saying fat. So that verse applies to everybody living in America. So let's go back to it again. So that means you. He says, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. And so what God is saying is no giving equals no love. God's saying no giving equals no love. We know who or what we love by the generosity shown. By the way, you know this is true. Here's why. I know some of you are feeling guilty right now, so let's talk about somebody else. Have you ever had those people in your life where they say, I love you, and you get that weird icky feeling? You know what I'm saying? You're just like, really? I mean, I, I have people all the time say, I love you, and, and my, my spider sense just goes, why? Because their words don't match their actions. Because they won't give me their time. They won't share with me their experience. Do you realize one of my greatest frustrations in the last year has been people telling me after I screw up that they knew I was going to go screw up? Well, that's helpful. Thanks. By the way, what were they saying by not sharing with me their experience and what God said to them? They were saying, I don't love you, Randy. I don't love you enough to talk to you about stuff. By the way, you got those people. I love you. But they don't give you anything. There's no gifts. There's no generosity. They're not big hearted to you. By the way, parents, can I tell something to you? Grandparents, can I tell you something? You want to know why your kids think you're full of crap? Because your words, they know in their heart that generosity equals love. Your words are not lining up with your actions. And so here's the truth. The truth is this. God wants us to be generous in every area of life. God wants us to be generous in every area of life. In fact, Jesus says it in this, Luke 6, 38. He says, give away your life. You'll find life given back. But not merely given back. Given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Now, why is giving, not getting, is the way? Why? Because 2 Corinthians 9, 6 tells us, a farmer who plants only a few seed will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You see, here's what God has done. You do realize God is in charge of this universe. God has ordered this universe. And God, for whatever reason, has ordered this universe that if you want to be blessed, if you want to be happy, if you want to prosper, you have to be generous. And when you don't do those things, then you will suffer. Now, some of you, before we move on to the next key, you need to understand this. Right now, you think this verse is a lie. You think God is uh, not fulfilling his end of the bargain because this is what you do. You say, but Randy, I'm being generous with my spouse. Randy, I'm being generous with my children. Randy, I'm being generous with my parents and my grandparents. I'm being generous but they're not giving me anything back. God didn't say that you were going to get it back for the person that you give to. I still remember the first time he told me to give a $200 tip to a waitress. You think I got anything back from her? No. What God says, though, is if you are generous with your spouse, if you're generous with your children, if you're generous with your parents and your grandparents and your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers, if you're generous there, what he will do is he'll come here over here and he will be generous back with something else. Do you understand that? Listen, I, I just found out this week that I got $10,000 worth of bills coming up in the next three months. And I know everybody thinks that I moved down to Florida because I wanted to live the life of Riley. Do you realize it's cost me $150,000 to move down to Florida? My savings is gone. 
So I'm starting to sweat. I'm still giving. If you know what year it is, you know how much I give. I'm still giving, and I'll keep saying, God, you know, hand speech therapy's hurting, and uh, Seminole's hurting, and everything's hurting. And then all of a sudden, out of the way, this out of left fear filled, I get a $4,000 check. Why? Because God says, hey, Randy, your generosity, I'm going to take care of you. And so am I worried about the other 6,000? No. If he miraculously came up with 4,000, I'm not really worried about six. And so if we want to be happy, if we want to enjoy the keys to happiness, we, first of all, we've got to free our world from worry through prayer, but we also got to free our spirit from selfishness through generosity. But number number three, and this is where some of you are right now because you walk in here and you're mad and you're upset and you're frustrated, and it's because you don't understand number three. We must free our days from disappointment through truth. We must free our days from disappointment through truth. Have you ever heard the story of Hannah in the Bible? Old part, 1 Samuel. Hannah wanted a baby. Bad. And it wouldn't have been so bad, but a rival. You, y'all have any rivals? We used to call them arch enemies. Y'all got any arch enemies in your life? You ever get that person that it seems like uh, that, that the devil just loves to use to make you feel bad about yourself? Well, Hannah wanted a baby so bad, but it wouldn't have been so bad, but her arch rival, her enemy, her nemesis had like 19. And so it got so bad that, look, notice, notice what 1 Samuel 1.10 said. It says, Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Now, why was she doing that? Well, Proverbs 13, 12 tells us. It says, when hope is crushed, the heart is crushed. But a wish come true fills you with joy. So Hannah was so crushed because her, 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 she had crushed hope because she was experiencing such deep disappointment. Well, this is what I found. Most of you, by the way, wouldn't it be nice to go back to Marissa and Emily's age and I'm Annual's age. Because, man, they think everything's going to turn out great. I mean, they think the world is awesome. They think that life's going to be great. They're going to get married. They're going to have 17 kids. They're going to be living in a mansion. And they're going to be driving these nice cars. And, and, and they're going to have those 17 kids. And they're not going to feel any pain. There's not going to be any pain in childbirth. And those kids are going to pop right out, and they're going to be happy, healthy, and wise, and they're going to be obedient, and they're going to, they're going to all line up for family pictures, and they're all going to dress, right? And they're all going to look the same. And, man, and man I still remember what I used to think the world was going to be like when I was Marissa and Emily and I'm Emmanuel's age. I just thought the world was going to be great. And then life happened. And then I had kids. What is it about kids that just crushes your soul? And y'all know I love kids. You get that, right? Think about how much I love my kids if they crush my soul, right? And what I have found is most of us walk through life just with deep disappointment. We're so disappointed with how we've turned out. We're so disappointed by how our families turned out. We're so disappointed by how life's turned out. And if we were honest, which I know most of you aren't, we would say we were deeply disappointed with God. Because we hear sermons about happiness, we hear sermons about the abundant life, and we're just disappointed. And so here's what I have found. I have found the reason why we are so disappointed is because we expect more from God and life than he's ever promised. We expect more from God and life than he's ever promised us. And that leads us to the fact, and the fact is this, the Bible gives us specific expectations for life. You want to know why some of you have unrealistic expectations? Because you've never read the word. Because the Bible gives us specific expectations for life. 1 Peter 1.6 says this, it is necessary for you to endure many trials for a while. 1 Peter 4.12 continues, it says, dear friends. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. What's he saying there? He's saying not only there, but throughout the Bible, the Bible teaches that living in a sinful world means tough times. Can I make the case? That disappointing kids, marriage struggles, 
and hurtful friends should be your biblical expectation in life. Think back to that Bible. Think about how many parents were profoundly disappointed in their children in the Bible. Think about how many marriages were on the rock in the Bible. Think about how many times a friend betrayed a friend in the Bible. They're biblical expectations. Why? Because the Bible gives us specific expectations for life that talk about how we must endure many trials. And so can I give you a truth? A truth that has kept me from going into dark depression. A truth that has kept me from murdering some people, to be honest with you. And the truth is this. We should expect the worst and hope for the best. We should expect the worst and hope for the best. By the way, all I'm doing there in that truth is simply restating what Jesus said in John 16, 33. He says, in the world you will have trouble, but cheer up, I have overcome the world. Now, what is it you'll have trouble mean? Jesus is saying, hey, expect the worst. Expect the fact that you're going to have trouble. Expect the fact that you're going to have trouble in your marriages and your families and your children and your finances. Expect it. Expect the fact that you're going to have worse. But then he says what? I have overcome. And then Jesus is saying, hey, hope for the best. Expect the worst, hope for the best. Expect that life is going to stink, but hope and God, that God's going to redeem it. Expect that God, everybody's going to fail you and hope that God's going to sustain you. You see, having biblical expectations is God's cure for your disappointment. Why? Because Jesus says in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Some of you are saying, but Randy, my life's horrible. Yeah. All I'm saying, why are you surprised? Have you read the Bible? See, some of you, the older I get, I knew this was coming, and it's, it's true. The older I get, I don't think some of you believe in heaven. Because if heaven was heaven, what makes heaven heaven is all of the disappointments won't be there. And so what God uses through our disappointments, what God uses through our trials and our tribulation is to remind us that, guess what? This world is not our home. The heaven is what we're longing for. And so if we're going to enjoy, if we're going to have keys to happiness, if we're going to be happy, we've got to free our world from worry through prayer. We've got to free our spirit from selfishness through generosity. We've got to free our days from disappointment through truth. But here's the last thing, man. Some of you might want to get up and leave. We've got to free our heart from hatefulness through forgiveness. We've got to free our heart from hatefulness through forgiveness. Now, here's the thing. Have you thought about this? We just celebrated Easter. So what did we celebrate at Easter? That all of our sins have been forgiven, right? That Jesus gave us a way to be right with God. The empty tomb reminded us that God died so that we could have a new heart and we could have a new life, that we could have a fresh start, right? And so you would think that Christians would be the happiest people in the world. You would think that Christians would be the happiest people in the world. Why? Because our sins are forgiven. We've been given a new heart. And we've received a ticket to heaven. But notice what the Bible says. Again, this, this Bible thing is kind of important if you haven't noticed. Notice what Hebrews 12, 15 warns. He says, watch out, you Christians, that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Ephesians 4, 32, 31 commands, get rid of your bitterness. He's talking to Christians. Get rid of your bitterness, hot tempers, anger, loud quarreling, cursing, and hatred. And so you would think we would be the happiest people in the world, but something seems to be quenching, something seems to be stifling, something seems to be blocking the happiness that God gave us and that God offers us. And this week I was reminded again as the why. But first, I need you to stay with me. First, let me establish a foundation. And the foundation is found in this fact. The fact is this. God's forgiveness comes with a built-in response. God's forgiveness comes with a built-in response. So if you receive God's forgiveness, understand that God's forgiveness comes with a built-in response mechanism that it comes into us and then we respond outward. 
You're saying, Randy, how do you know that? Well, notice what Ephesians 4.32 says. He says, forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. And so what God's forgiveness is, it's designed for us to receive it and then give it away. Receive it and give it away. That's why you hear Jesus say things like, how many times are you supposed to forgive somebody? 70 times 7. How many times are you supposed to forgive a brother or a Christian who sins against you? If he comes and, sin, sin, uh, and says he's sorry seven times, you forgive him seven times. Why? Because forgiveness is designed to be received and then given away. And notice it's a command. Why? It's a command because we've been forgiven so much. Many of you have heard me talk about the story. If you don't, write this down. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. I, that's your homework. If you want to do homework, there you go. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. But in that story, he talks about the importance of forgiveness. And, and it was so funny because, you know, I've, I've shared this with some of you in the past. And obviously, economy's different. Math's different. So I went back and I redid the numbers because basically Jesus is talking about one man got forgiven a lot and one man was forgiven a little. And the man who was forgiven a lot was forgiven $300 million in today's money, right? So there was this man who owed somebody $300 million, and they were forgiven that debt, right? He then walks out. The man who'd been forgiven $300 million walks out, and he finds somebody that owes him $3,000. So it's $300 million versus $3,000. Now, you would think, I've just been forgiven $300 million. This person owes me $3,000. You would think what? Okay, I'll just naturally take a little bit of what I've been given, and I'll give it away. No, he doesn't. He throws the guy in prison over $3,000. He's been forgiven $300 million, and he throws somebody in prison for $3,000. Well, then Jesus continues with the story and says, okay, look at your sheet. He says in Matthew 18, 32 through 33, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Now, hear me. I've got a wife right here staring at me with a smile on her face who has so much hatefulness in her heart toward her husband. And the sad thing is, I know what she did. I know who she was before Jesus saved her. I know how she acted. I know that she deserved to be dead 50 times over. And has her husband sinned against her? Absolutely. Oh, yes, he's, he's messed up. He's fallen. But you're willing to tell me that he sinned against you 3,000 and God's forgiven you 300 million and you can't forgive him. And that's where we are, guys. You do realize you're the 300 million in this story. That for God to forgive you all of your sin means he's forgiven you 300 million dollars worth of sin. And all those people in your life that you're mad at and that you're upset with, that you refuse to forgive, that you've let that root of bitterness come up, you've gotten hot-tempered, you've gotten angry, you're using loud words, you're cussing, you're cursing, you're doing all this stuff. They've sinned against you three. Okay, let's just say they forgive you 100, they've sinned against you $100,000 worth. You've still been forgiven $300 million. You ain't got to be a math geek to understand that don't work. You've been forgiven $300 million? Are you dare trying to convince me that somebody has sinned against you more than you've sinned against God? You see, Randy, why is that so important? Why? Because of this truth. Much of our hatefulness comes as a result of God's torment. You want to know why Christians aren't happy? Because Christians are being tormented. Much of our hatefulness comes as a result of of God's torment. You see, Jesus continues in Matthew 18, 35. He says, the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And then this is what Jesus said. He goes, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. You see, Christians who refuse to forgive 
have a torturer that's with them day and night. Christians who refuse to forgive are being tormented and tortured. See, they want to blame the devil. And some of you are sitting there, Randy, you know, Randy, I keep casting off the devil. I keep casting off them demons. I keep casting off. It ain't the demons. Let me explain something to you. You can cast off the devil. You can cast off the demons, but you ain't casting off God. And if he sent a tormenting spirit into you, there's not a prayer out there that will save you. Why? Because you have blocked You've got this $300 million worth of forgiveness in you, and it's longing to get out, and you're blocking it, and you're refusing to let it out because somehow, some way, you've been hurt. And God's like, okay, I'm going to torment you. I'm going to torture you until you let it out. Let me ask you something. What does your torture look like? Because, see, I don't think some of you, some of you are like doctors now. You might, you misdiagnose everything. You've got health problems right now, and for some reason you're convinced that your health problems have got nothing to do with you. Might I suggest that God is tormenting you through your unforgiveness, and it's being manifested through your body. Some of you right now, there's nobody that loves you. Why? You've driven them all away. How can you love somebody who's bitter? Bitter people are like people who are throwing up projectile vomit all the time. Do you want to hang out with somebody that projectile vomits all the time? Some of you right now, God's punishing you because the only way to get your attention is your finances. Because you're a money-worshiping person. And you're thinking that your money problems are because Bidenomics. You think your money problems are because of inflation no let me explain something to you the righteous prosper no matter what the economy might i suggest that those tormenting places in your life could be coming from a heart of unforgiveness and so as we go into prayer my question who do you need to forgive what do you need to forgive? Because, by the way, you can pray, you can be generous, you can do this and you can do that. But if you don't forgive, Christian, you ain't ever going to be happy. Stop blaming everybody else. You do realize a Christian's happiness is not dependent upon anybody except their obedience to God. So do me a favor. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Notice I did something there that I don't normally do. And that in the sermon, I talk directly to Christians. And that last point. All the other points apply to everybody. But that last point only applies to Christians. Why? Because we can't give forgiveness away if we've never received it. And so my question for you today is simple. When did God forgive you all your sin? When was your moment when you surrendered, you turned your, like we learned last week, you turned your life over to Jesus. When was the moment that you turned your life over to Jesus, you surrendered to him, and he gave you forgiveness for every sin that you have committed, every sin that you are committing, every sin that you will commit? When did that happen? Because you cannot give forgiveness away because if you haven't received it. And I'm firmly convinced that some of you, the reason why you're so unforgiving, the reason why you're so bitter and ugly and hateful is because you've never been forgiven. Because, if, man, if God's genuinely forgiven you, whoo, it's hard not to be happy. And so when were you forgiven? When was your moment? When was your time? Well, guess what? It can be here. Before you worrying about forgiving anybody else, before you worrying about deal, dealing with your disappointment or your selfishness, and your worry, how about this? How about we deal with your sin? Right here, right now, can be your moment. This can be your holy ground. This can be that time that you look back years from now and say, that was where I surrendered. That was when I handed my life over to Jesus. Do it now as I pray for you. Dear God, I just lift up everyone here. God, please, if somebody's here is not saved, save them. Because, Lord, if they try to live out this sermon, they're going to fail. The only hope we have is, is founded upon forgiveness and salvation through you. So, Lord, I just pray. God, I just ask in Jesus' name 
that you will work in the hearts and minds. Give them the desire and the power to confess their sin, to call upon the name of the Lord, to be saved. Lord, may today be the moment that they surrender, that they hand their, hand their life over to Jesus Christ. And Lord, right now, I just pray that you'll be with the Christians here. As we go into this next level of invitation, Lord, I pray that you'll work powerfully in their life. May they walk out of here with a smile on their face because there's happiness in their heart. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.